Hi, this is Thomas with LibertarianProgressive.com. <clears throat> the title of this uh, video is U.S. Election 2016, Expectations After the Dust Settles, Objective Analysis, Pros and Cons, and Hopes and Fears. <laughs> now, there's more going on on Election Day besides just Trump and Hillary Clinton, the presidential election. And this is an analysis done November 20th, 12 days af after Election Day, as I titled it, After the Dust Settles. <clears throat> so I've seen a lot of videos and reactions and summaries the day of the Election Day, seeing reactions the day after, a couple days after. I kind of want to let it sink in see some of the other results besides just the presidential elections tell you a little bit about what we do and give you an objective analysis here and so why I named it expectations well one thing is <clears throat> there really hasn't been too many surprises as I can think further back thinking back to um, Bill Clinton in 1992 um, you know was it a surprise that he had the Monica Lewinsky scandal, you know, where he um, had those relations, quote unquote, with the intern, especially when there was a history of it before. And, you know, the national media did bring it up before he was elected in 1992. It shouldn't have been a huge surprise. There were warning signs. You know, were there any warning signs about the first George W. Bush, or I, I should say George W. Bush in his first term? Um, you know, that he hasn't really had a real job, that Dick Cheney was going to be his uh, vice president after he selected him to be um, on his committee to find the right vice presidential candidate, and he ended up picking himself and he was the ex-CEO of Halliburton, and, you know, his first couple of weeks after being elected, they were drawing up blueprints and maps how to divide Iraq, and, um, <clears throat> you know, and Condoleezza Rice is a national security uh, advisor, you know, had given him a, uh, a briefing about some um, possible plans to of terrorism and things like that and um and Barack Obama um uh never having much experience and his first week he hired a bunch of lobbyists into the administration and you know he had uh, voted for the bailouts before he was became president um he did give some talk against uh the Patriot Act, so there could have been some expectations of him making some kind of change, but even before he was elected, I think there's plenty of warning signs about you know, him not being the uh, hope and change that some people might have hoped he was going to do, and he was going to play three-dimensional chess you know, and uh, be on our side. And of course, Hillary Clinton had plenty of warning signs about voting for the Iraq War, the Patriot Act, voting for the bailouts, you know, supporting the TPP, the Clinton Foundation, etc. What about Donald Trump? I mean, what are the warning signs? Now, whether you're pro-Trump, anti-Trump, neutral, this is going to be objective. I'm going to give things that are pro-Trump here arguments and things that are, you know, skeptical, okay? And so that's what this is. I, You know, if you just want someone to preach to the choir, then... I find that kind of boring. I have a mind, I'm going to think, and I'm just going to give you an objective analysis here and share lots of different other reactions from other people, just a summary of it. And so what would be some of the warning signs? I mean, and some of the good signs. I mean, he has talked about um, possibly being more dipl diplomatic with Russia, saying that we should have never been in Iraq. In fact, he railed against the establishment Republicans, and and he just totally ripped up the establishment Republicans. Um, <clears throat> and uh, those are all good signs, I think. And so maybe he'll do the same thing once and drain the swamp, per se, you know, in Congress and Washington and all the lobbyists. He says he wants 
um, stricter rules against uh, the revolving door for lobbyists. He has had a history of supporting Jesse Ventura when he ran as an independent governor for Minnesota. Uh, a lot of times in the past, he was supporting Ross Perot and um, the uh, Reform Party. Um, you know, he's against the TPP. He used to be pretty um, socially liberal and uh, fiscally conservative. Um, now, he has had dealings of... Uh, being an insider, um, buying special interests, using eminent domain, <clears throat> you know, and other heavy-handed tactics against his competitors. And, um, you know, uh, he w inherited a lot of money, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So, and he has hired some people so far in his campaign that are kind of questionable so what so you know based on these you should be able to build reasonable expectations and he has flip-flopped on some issues so it's kind of hard to tell so <clears throat> what i have done is um accumulated and i'm just going to give like a brief 30 seconds on each of these videos i've accumulated some of my favorite reaction videos to the election I'm going to start with this one. I'm just showing different perspectives. I'm not saying anyone's right or wrong. I like looking at, you know, if I have a subject I want to research, I want to research the pros. I want to research the cons. I don't want to just preach to the choir. My choir is finding the truth. And so here's the first one I saw here. Reality trumps why you should not be voting this election. And this person's argument is that it's all rigged. Do you think that... You know, the system who has a corrupt media would allow a Trump to, you know, basically trump the system. It's all staged and set up. They, you know, Trump is exactly where they have positioned him, just like a piece on a chess game. And um, he's doing their bidding and he's just another pawn and he's nothing more than just another placeholder. And so it's all set up. You know, they built him up and they made it seem like they were against him, but that's just to trick you, basically. So that's one opinion. I'm going to share them all. So here's another one from a very popular YouTuber, Philip DeFranco. He was kind of more neutral, um, how everything just got scarier, weirder, and more divided in one Trump day. And this was on November 10th, uh, just two days after Election Day. He was talking about how some of his friends were um, scared, how some were excited. And this this previous video, by the way, was like about a month before the election day. And here's another one from Philip DeFranco. Um, this one was right after the election day. Trump won, now what? You know, I think he had uh, some pretty good uh, summarization there. Here's another one, the Young Turks, um, November 11th. Just three days after Election Day, the very real threat of a Trump dictatorship. And, you know, he has said some things about, you know, he has later said that he's going to do everything constitutionally. But um, he has said some things against the media that are kind of questionable. He has sued just for people making jokes against him lots of times. Um, you know, not have always paid uh, contractors who have worked under him been hypocritical about hiring uh, illegal immigrants and, and things like that. And, um, you know, some of his rallies has had a lot of violence. And uh, he kind of demagogues and scapegoats certain groups. And, um, and so not above doing that. But also maybe he knows how to play the game. And it's another three-dimensional chess thing like with Obama. But maybe this time it's for real. So that's an interesting point of view here. Here's another one, racist emboldened by Trump victory, talking about some of some attacks and things like that that have happened after. Not, you know, a whole lot. And, and maybe some of the media is focusing on certain events more than others um, or or. And see, here's another one by David Pakman, outsider Trump bamboozles voters, hires corporate lobbyists within hours of the election. This one's dated November 10th. 
um, some prior Goldman Sachs lobbyists. And uh, so that's questionable. Oil company lobbyists. Um, here's David Pacman again. We have two Americas. Working together is a fantasy world. Yeah, we basically do have two countries inside this one country in some sense, if not at least three, politically speaking. But he does say at the end, you know, there are certain issues like uh, not going to war, maybe that we should try to work on against the, um, you know, the bad trade deals. Here's another one. Um, November 10th, we rule the media how the alt-rights permanently defeated the corrupt mainstream media, Josh Bernstein show, saying, uh, you know, America stood up and elected Trump, and that's kind of like a big middle finger to the uh, establishment media. They didn't expect it at all, and actually this is not a staged event. This is something that, um, you know, will help make things right in the future, at least in the right path. Here's another reaction by journalist uh, Jonathan Capehart breaks down over Trump's America um, and just saying that, uh, you know, how some people are really scared, especially if they're illegal immigrants and stuff. Some of them are really crying and scared and afraid they're going to get deported and, and not know what's happening, just having a lot of stress and, and uncertainty. And... Um, all right, and here's uh, Russell Brand. Trump, right, okay, the world's gone nuts. Russell Brand, the trues, true news. Here's a f female Muslim, lifelong Democrat, explains why she voted for Donald Trump. Uh, Anderson Cooper interview. I guess she's in Milwaukee. Looks like that's her here. Um again in some of these uh side videos um this i just thought was funny donald trump vines versus hillary clinton vines um you know they're just funny little quirky six minute clips that people have made throughout and actually i made a compilation i made a playlist of 2016 campaign music uh, i'll show you where that is at the end of this pretty some very creative stuff this guy is the uh, owner of Mox News, um, a great YouTube site, how Donald Trump can create millions of jobs overnight. He comments on different news articles. His argument is uh, to legalize cannabis or marijuana, and, um, and Trump will create at least, you know, I think Colorado itself created like 20,000 new jobs and lots of income. You know, if Trump wants to have a successful presidency, uh, you know, take marijuana off the schedule one, decriminalize it, let it be regulated, taxed, and um, let hemp be uh, created to make ethanol and to make clothes and rope and uh, plastics, building materials, and let's have a booming, um, let's have that be a kind of a spark to a booming economy. And... I'd say also myself, uh, let's change some of the military spending into investing renewable energies and into outer space exploration. This is, I thought, really interesting, and I wanted to make a point about this. Um, think of it as voting with your middle finger. Now, here's Alan Grayson, outgoing Florida congressperson after this term. I think a good congressperson overall. He wants to make it a law where we have none of the above as a voting option. Nevada has that, but even if none of the above wins, whoever's a real person will still win. So it doesn't have like any um, enforcement to it, except it just shows that none of the above actually won. So it's more of a gesture. But he wants to actually propose to make this an actual law, and I see nothing wrong with it. In fact, I think it's a great thing. If none of the above wins, then you would have a re-election. And that's not going to happen often, but if there's actually enough people who chooses none of the above, then they know what is coming, and if that's the majority, it should be able to be selected. I mean, it's hardly ever going to happen except once in a blue moon. And if that once in a blue moon it's needed, it should be selected. He's showing on some of the charts here that none of the above would have actually won this year. 
and we had the whether you're a Trump or Hillary supporter, I mean, the truth is these are the two most unpopular candidates ever. And um, so another thing is you get to choose none of the above in every area of your life. You know, you don't have just two choices for everything. You can always choose no. Sometimes you have eight or ten choices or unlimited. You know, like um, like in the the dating game or who you want to marry. You don't just have two choices and you have to pick one and that's who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. You can choose none of the above or you can just wait. I mean, until there's other people, right? Well, shouldn't you be able to do that for the most important things of who's going to send your kids to war? And what your taxes are going to be and your business regulations and other regulations that could send people to jail or war. Um, So, yeah, I think just fundamentally you have that absolute right. So watch this video. But you know what makes me upset a little bit is some people are making this into, you know, don't be a sore loser. You know, Trump won. This has nothing to do with Trump versus Hillary. This is just a principled argument on itself. We're not trying to go back and redo the election. Personally, I don't disagree with the electoral college system. So, I mean, I think of it as like, you know, kind of like in the United Nations when they vote, you wouldn't expect everyone to have an, I mean, you would expect each country to kind of have an equal vote. Like you wouldn't want one country that has hundreds of millions of people to be able to override, you know, like, so California is just going to decide everything we all always do. No, that's not fair. You kind of think of the 50 states as 50 countries because it's kind of like how it was originally set up. And so they have an equal voice. But I still think that there should be a none of the above option. I mean, it's just a principle that's, you know, it's really unprincipled for someone to favor something when their person's in charge, but not when someone else isn't. You got to, if you're going to agree on something, it's got to be whether it's your person or the other person's in charge. That's the only thing that's going to be consistent and um, that's going to have validity. And if someone doesn't understand that, I personally don't think someone like that's mature enough really to um to to be in the debates or or to really vote to be quite honest i mean those are fundamental principles and uh so none of the above it should be an option and if it wins the majority which is very unlikely but in the severe cases where it could then damn it then that should be you know the prevailing uh votes it should be recognized. Here's Alex Jones interviewing Jesse Ventura, November 17th. Jesse Ventura praises Trump for promoting peace with Russia. Yeah, actually, he kind of spin that title a little bit. I mean, Jesse says, give him a year and I'll tell you what I think. But he does think that it's a positive sign that Trump is promoting peace with Russia. And I agree with that. And I do say give Trump a chance. Um, and treat issue each issue on on its own. Dave Chappelle, he kind of gave a Saturday Night Live monologue at the end. He said to give Trump a chance, and I thought that was good. And I thought Trump gave a pretty good, um, you know, a speech, accepting the uh, the results of the election. Um, here's just some other things I want to show that were results of Election Day where third-party candidates were strongest. This is from Reason.com. You know, you can see this map here of where Gary Johnson got 5%, the darker the blue, the higher the percentage he had gotten. And same with Jill Stein, the higher, the darker the green. So if you're interested in what states might be more open to third parties or whatever, uh, this could be an interesting map for you to look at. Um, a, a list of third-party performances in the United States. This is on Wikipedia, and you can see a history of it. Of course, Abraham Lincoln being the, one of the first third-party candidates to make it all the way through. Current third-party office holders in the United States. Angus King. Some of these are no longer in there, but there's been a long history and a long history of third-party candidates influencing the election. Some of the initiative referendums, if you don't know what an initiative referendum is, it's where people collect enough signatures to put 
a law or reform on the ballot in their particular states, and the people directly vote on it. Sometimes it's got to be voted on two election seasons in a row to go through. Sometimes there's some standards in certain states, like it's got to reach at least 60% to be approved, like in Florida. But these are going to actually be added to the state's constitutional amendment. So some states, like Nebraska and Oklahoma, endorsed death penalty measures. Um, Colorado, Maine, and Arizona approved minimum wage increases. Um, Colorado had something to do with assisted suicide. California had a, some law about, you know, porn stars not needing to use condoms, uh, you know, whatever. Um, Maine had a really important one, though, the state of Maine. They not only um, legalized through initiative referendum to legalize recreational marijuana, they, Maine is also the first state to adopt ranked choice voting for statewide elections, changing how the governor, state legislators, and members of Congress will be elected. Voters approved a ballot initiative on Election Day that moved Maine to a system in which the candidates need a majority of votes to be victorious. Previously, whenever a candidate received a plurality of the votes or more than anyone else, they won. Going forward, if there are multiple candidates on the ballot and none receives 50% of the votes, ranked voting kicks in. Instead of simply choosing a single candidate, voters must also rank candidates from first to last. The last place candidate is eliminated and his or her votes. So I do think this is one of the most important things out of this entire election season. And I, th there's different versions of ranked voting. Um, this is not the one I particularly prefer. I, I prefer my choice score voting, S-C-O-R-E, score voting. You can Google that. Um, but uh, ranked voting um, is... Uh, is something I think in the right direction and also here um, here's the states that actually legalized recreational marijuana Arizona failed California passed Maine passed Massachusetts passed Nevada passed Arkansas for medical marijuana Florida for medical Montana for uh, medical in North Dakota for medical marijuana. So you have four more states, California, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, now along with Washington, Colorado, Alaska, Oregon, Washington, D.C., um, and maybe a couple others that are no longer going to fill up their jails and uh, split up families. I mean, and waste taxpayer dollars, give people a criminal record, ha have unjust uh, justice under the law. You know, marijuana isn't just about just giving people the right to get high. Um, here's the biggest argument. There are kids right now in CPS, Child Protective Services, custody right now because one or both of their parents are spending years, if not decades, in prison because all they did was smoke a joint. We have the highest prison population in any country in the entire world. You can look that up. That is a fact. We have a higher prison population in percentage and actual numbers than China, than Russia, than Iran, probably all put together. And half of those arrests are for marijuana charges, believe it or not. You might not believe me. You look that up. It's true. And we're splitting up families. We're giving people criminal records to make it harder for them to find a job. We're, we've spent over a trillion dollars. We're invading people's privacy. You know what asset forfeiture is? It's when someone pulls someone over on the highway, like a cop, and they find thousands of dollars in their car and because they believe it has to do with drugs they just take the money and a lot of times it's turned out it's just been someone going across state borders to purchase a car to start a business someone carry, carrying charitable donations for nonprofits, and it's seized there's been more asset forfeitures in 2015 than there were actually reported burglaries and robberies there's been there's over 70,000 no-knock raids a year and about 10 percent of them are to the wrong house you know there's been old ladies who have cancer 
you're trying to smoke some marijuana and their house get raided and they get put in jail. This is happening. This is real life. That's why I'm talking passionately about it right now. Um, there's people who are refugees going to some of these states where marijuana is legal, packing up, selling their home, getting a new job, just so they could have their kids who have multiple sclerosis have the medication that they need so they don't have seizures anymore. So we can't even research it now because it's a Schedule One drug. It shouldn't be scheduled at all. You know, we used to grow it for hemp for victory. It's only been illegal since 1972, since Richard Nixon made it uh, the war against drugs because they're actually trying to find a backdoor way to prosecute protesters and um, union organizers. And so... Uh, you know, plus, I mean, there's, you know, if if you're sick about um, third world countries with these bad trade deals taking our jobs, well, the private prison industry loves these three strikes and your outlaws, loves having people convicted for longer sentences for marijuana than actual rapists and killers because it fills up their private prison jail cells. And with that profit, they use do it in a revolving door way and then give more money back to the Congress people who make these strict laws where um, they're not even tried by jury. They just have these mandatory minimums. And, um, and then when they go into these private prisons, they tell them, you know, you either uh, have, um, you know, you're in solitary confinement or you work a job. And how many private prisons are taking calls for, like, insurance companies, telemarketing, making furniture? You know, the New Hampshire license plates that say live free or die on the back of them? Those are made by private prisoners, probably making less than a dollar an hour. So they're taking our jobs. That's unfair competition. And so if you want to do something about all of that, now, I'm not saying there isn't a serious issue with meth and some other gangs, but you know what? Look where the money is. The biggest special interests that we're funding um, against these initiative referendums to make marijuana legal, I prefer to call it cannabis, were the pharmaceutical companies and alcohol companies. Um, there are others, like uh, prison companies, and probably drug dealers themselves. So, and you probably have less meth with, you know, for the people who need it, treat it like a health issue. You probably have half the cost than putting someone in prison. In fact, it costs like twice as much to put someone in prison. And I'm just talking about nonviolent drug offenses. If someone commits a crime, they should, you know, go to jail if they assault someone. If an employer doesn't want to hire someone doing marijuana, I don't think they should be forced to. If someone is driving a car impaired, you know, they shouldn't be able to do that, you know. So we're just talking about not putting people, making people criminals. So, so yeah, we have four more states where people aren't going to be criminals for marijuana. This country was, a lot of it was built on marijuana, you know. Um, in World War II, they... The military, U.S. military made a video called Hemp for Victory. I mean, if we had true justice under the law, there's been polls that are factual that over 50% of this country has tried marijuana. Either you lock up 50% of the people or you let the other 50, you know, you let the people in jail just for that go. Because there's otherwise you're inconsistent in the judicial system. Either we're equal under the law or we're not. And so here's some other videos. Uh, crooked Donald Trump to pro profit from the controversial oil pipeline. And this is in North Dakota. If you haven't kept up with that, there's um, this oil pipeline trying to be built by this oil company through these sacred Indian burial grounds, which if, you know, you care about property rights, this is a true property rights issue. But Trump has actually invested into this oil company, and this oil company gave him some political donations. So we'll see how that goes. Maybe Trump will say, hey, this is uh, – but he's not so good on eminent domain, right? So we'll see. If he really stands up for this, 
that will be very interesting. Now, this guy thinks Trump being elected is uh, a prayer answered for God. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. But I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Someone else claimed that. Here's Sam Harris, the most powerful clown. He considers Donald Trump. Um, here's uh, Ted Nugent, you know, thinking this is a breath of fresh air that Trump was elected November 9th. And by the way, that Sam Harris was on November 12th. This was this one, um, Alternative Media TV, this guy, that was on November 9th. And so here's Anonymous message to Donald Trump saying they know some of the good things Trump has done in the past and hopes Trump stays on that path. Um, list of U.S. presidential elections where the winner lost a popular vote. John Quincy Adams, which was a good president. Rutherford B. Hayes, Benjamin Harrison, George W. Bush, Donald Trump. And like I said, I do agree with Electoral College. Now, here's my YouTube channel libertarian progressive you can visit the website right from here it's youtube.com slash blast not breath but blast of fresh air and here's the main playlist i have i have some of these uh little f f quick snippets um i did over let's see how many interviews there's 49 videos here these are all independent and third-party candidates, all on the ballots, all the only third options in their area or districts. For Congress, I stayed out of the whole presidential fray, pretty much. I wanted It's a lot less divisive to talk about Congress, no matter whether you're a Democrat, Republican, independent. I think we all could agree that there should be more competition in Congress. I will feel like I have served one of my main purposes for society is... If we have more than just Republicans and Democrats in Congress specifically, even if you are a diehard Republican and Democrat, you have to admit there's nothing better that you could do to help your party, your political party, your team, than add some competition. Because if they have no competition, they're going to get lazy and fat, which they are more than that. So, I mean, I think once we have at least 10 independent third-party candidates inside of the House of Representatives, and or the Senate, that's going to break open the floodgates, and there's no looking back on that, because it's a psychological block that people have. You know, it's a self-perpetuating prophecy, and um, self-inflicted, and and so I don't blame people for not thinking that they want to, don't want to waste their votes on a third party because they might get the worse or two evils at the presidential level. But at the congressional level, you can't make that same excuse because there's a buffer of 435 members of Congress. So even if you take a risk on your specific congressperson, there's 435 others that kind of buffer out that risk. And everyone, it, well, even if you're a Green Party, you could vote for a Libertarian and vice versa because the main thing of the game is a more fair election system like score voting and and if a third party or independent gets elected, it's just going to open people's minds and create new neural networks and possibilities of that even being possible. And uh, so that's the real glass ceiling is the independent third party candidates. Candidates are not bought and sold out by big corporations, people being responsible and not letting money buy elections and saying the money doesn't even matter. I'm just going to educate myself and vote for who I think is right, you know, and vote my conscience and do that. And the Congress is the way to do that. You know what? The people who really fear Trump or Hillary, they wouldn't fear them so much if we actually had a responsible Congress. You know, it's a it's a co-equal branch of government that deserves co-equal media time, which it doesn't get. And these third-party and independent candidates who are on the ballot, and I stress, the, I only interviewed ones that are on the ballot, and I only interviewed ones that are the only third options in their area. So if there are more than one third-party candidate in a district, I would skip that district and find a district where there's only one third option. And um, so these are the least controversial ones, people to be elected. They're all on the ballot. Some of them got in the debates. Some of them didn't. Some very good interviews. And what I also did was make quick clips because a lot of these interviews are like um, 
a half an hour, 45 minutes, some are less than that. Some I had some, you know, okay views for me. I mean, four, 399, some almost 1,000. But I made some quick clips, which I'm going to do with the rest of them. But, you know, I work full-time and part-time, and so, you know, I just spent really one month doing this. I interviewed more independent third-party candidates than anyone in any media organization ever. And um, so, and I did that in 2012 as well, and I hope to do that in two more years in 2018. I want to get the message out. I want other media to interview these people. If these people had more media time and there's just a, there is a wave of reform, a wave of wanting to drain a swamp, whether you're on the left or the right, to get rid of the crony capitalism and the cronyism. Imagine if all the media that I just showed before here, if all of them interviewed at least 10 independent third-party candidates. You know, and imagine if the Young Turks in, in interviewed 25 independent third-party candidates consistently, or Alex Jones did, or David Pakman, or Alternative Media, or, you know, hundreds of these people did that over and over again and just keep bringing these faces into our lives we would think of them as more viable candidates and know about them and um that's my whole goal i mean i would like to see at least 10 independent third party candidates in congress you know it's about building consensus let's say you had 10 issues that you really cared about five of them had consensus five of those issues didn't if you had any you know <laughs> stress any um, gift of strategy, which five would you focus on first? The five that has consensus, right? Then you can argue about the five that doesn't after you accomplish the five that does. And we haven't even gotten together and been unified to accomplish the five that do have consensus. Like ending crony capitalism, reforming our voting system, legalizing cannabis, um, you know, cutting spending on the wars, and and there's many others. I have a whole list. Please visit my website. We're having a crowdfund campaign, and, and help us out with that. It's libertarianprogressive.com. But I did want to, uh, let me just finish up here. Um, you know, I'm not about preaching to the choir, even though I don't mind that. You know, am I loyal to the the land itself or the ideas of the Constitution? Amer to me, America is the Constitution. <clears throat> it's the first country built on ideas, not just, you know, a cliche group. You know, I don't care if it was George Washington who was just elected. We need to hold them accountable. Liberty requires eternal vigilance. You know, don't play their game. Let's play our game. And, uh... Instead of don't votes, which half the population still didn't in this crucial election, half the population didn't even vote. So Donald Trump was elected with probably about 25% of the votes. Instead of not voting, just don't vote for who you don't, just vote for a third party. That's better than not voting. You know, could, I wrote Teddy Roosevelt here. Teddy Roosevelt was another kind of well affluent person from New York. This is my best hope for Donald Trump. I'll try to be positive here for a moment. And he was from New York. He was a well-to-do person. He didn't believe in um, hyphenated Americans. He won the Nobel Peace Prize by preventing Russia and Japan from going into a world war, basically, or a big war. And uh, he made America great in some ways. And he was a trust buster. He wasn't. He didn't play along with the um, establishment, and could Donald Trump end up being like a Teddy Roosevelt? I think that would be a. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt was somewhat of a nationalist. In the best case scenario, I think Donald Trump could end up being like a Teddy Roosevelt. Now, what does the Bible say about government and strife? Well, let's take a look here in the first book of Samuel. Israel asked for a king. Because once some people think Trump is a gift from God and we need a strong leader, right? Well, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. 
but his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all other nations have. You know, I don't care about other nations. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. You know, and Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all this that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. And Samuel said, to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. So hopefully, I mean, this reminds me of, you know, America. America believes in the natural rights. That's a constitution, I should say, the United Constitution of the United States. You know, basically God is, in a sense, the belief that no one else is a God over us. And so we're all here, and God is our only ruler. And in fact, but, you know, God is not directly here in a sense. I mean, you could say that God is, but, but the main thing about God is that you're free to do what you want. You have free will, and no one else can tell you what to do because no one else is God. So you could say a belief in God is a belief that you are not God. A belief in God is a belief that any other person that I see around me that, you know, that I can see and hear and interact with is not God. Okay. If that makes sense, a belief in God is that you're not God or you or you or you or you, you etc. Anyone else. And then none of you have the right to tell me what to do. It's our principles and laws and due process that does. And here's another one I just wanted to close on here, Bible verses about strife, especially in the book of Proverbs. You know, there's a lot about um, avoiding strife brings a man honor. He that loves transgression also loves strife. Lips of fools bring them strife. Um, hatred steers up trouble, but loves forgives all. Love forgives all wrongs. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. A greedy man stirs up strife. A wrathful, wrathful man stirth up strife. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Drive out a scoffer and strife will go out and quarreling and abuse will cease. Fire goes out without wood and quarrels, quarrels disappear when gossip stops. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife p 
belongeth not to him is like one that taketh the dog by the ears. Okay, I, didn't, I have to admit, I didn't really get that last one. But, you know, I, when you look at strife and, and people just calling everyone else names and, and things like that, I mean, let's not play their game. Let's play our game. Let's focus on what we can do. All right, not what we can't do. And what we can do and what's the most realistic is, I think, voting and focusing on Congress. Here's the website here. We have 715 days, 20 hours and 50 minutes left until November 6, 2018, where we'll be voting on the House of Representatives again. You want to see our purpose here? You can view all our videos here um, at the top here. Candidate interviews, main index page. Um, so check it out. And you can help us by uh, clicking on our Amazon link and saving that as your favorites. United we stand, divided we fall. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Please give it a thumbs up, share, subscribe comments um i you know we'll just say an optimistic point here at the end i do think of course uh i think the best days are ahead and and so yeah let's interact uh let me know what you think and leave it in the comments and i'll be sure to uh reply back and um I do think there needs to be a lot more discussion in the politics. You can run from politics, but or you can hide from politics, but ho you know what is that saying? You can run from politics. Let me google that real quick. You can ig ignore politics, but politics will not ignore you, right? Um you can ignore politics all you want, but politics won't ignore you. Well, we'll see. I mean, maybe some people that are, you know, that the, you know that you, you know what the secret is, where what you focus on becomes your reality. I mean, honestly, is it possible if you? I guess that's more in the philosophical and metaphysical realm, right? If you just completely ignored it, would it just go away? Well. I don't know. I think that's something to really think about, and maybe we're just playing their game. So I'd say get involved in politics, but do it in your way. You know, and make them defend, like offer such good solutions, like um, that the whoever is against those good solutions will have to defend why those aren't good solutions, you know. And I would start with very fundamental things. And these are very fundamental things, I think, that have the biggest consensus, and I have them listed here, uh, starting with a more fair election reform, open primaries, maybe an election day holiday, although now we have early voting, fair debates, rank and score voting, none of the above option, a paper trail. Let's just start with that. Can we all just agree to start with that no matter what side you're on? Election fair and equal elections. All right, that's it for now.